There you go. Just a, just a humorous look at what we've been studying the last few weeks, and this is this truth, that your work matters. What you do from Monday to Friday is of great importance to God. And what we've been trying to do is connect Sunday worship with Monday work. And we've looked at several things. We've tried to blow apart the sacred-secular divide. You know, that, that concept that, you know, Sunday is sacred, but Monday through Saturday is secular. God cares about what we do on Sunday, but he really doesn't care about what we do the rest of the week. We've seen you're in my original job description in Genesis chapter 1 is God created man and placed him there in the garden and gave him, gave us a responsibility. We saw the fact that your work is worship. That same Hebrew word that is translated work there in the very beginning is translated worship throughout the Old Testament, signifying that that your work, what you do at your job is worship for God. Last week, Brad did a great job of demonstrating what is your and my place in the kingdom of God. So today, we kind of want to pull back just a little bit, and we want to see the big picture. What, what, is the, what is the big picture from God's viewpoint? Let me illustrate in a simple way. So for, for 10 years, Vicki and I lived in Mexico City. Mexico City, when we lived there, was the largest city in the world. About 30 million people lived in the valley of Mexico. We lived in the northwest section of the city, which was uh, the area we lived in is called Berjel de las Arboledas. It was just in the northern section, and then the church that we started is in uh, Linda Vista. It was all in the northern section, and that's where our world was. Uh, uh, I mean, we traversed back and forth across the northern section, and it was easy to forget that we lived in this huge city until we either flew in on an airplane, or we drove up one of the mountains that circled the city, or we climbed the Latin, I guess took the elevator up, the Latin American Tower, and we looked over the vastness of Mexico City. I think we have a picture, if we could put that, that, that picture up, guys. And so when we lived in our little neighborhood, it was easy for us to forget how big the city was. But all of a sudden, when we saw the city from a different perspective, we were able to see the big picture. So so today we want to pull back for just a second, and I want you to see the big picture, because if we're not careful, we get up and we go to work on Monday, and all we see is the small picture of what is taking place in our lives, and we fail to see the big picture of what God's trying to do in this world and what God is trying to do through us. So our text today is the entire Bible. All right, so if you look in your outline, our text is Genesis 1-1 through Revelation chapter 22, verses 20 and 21. So are you ready to read all of that today? No, we're not going to read the entire Bible, but let's read the first verse, and then let's read the last few verses, all right? So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, you know it. Many of you could probably quote it by heart. It simply says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why don't you read that with me today? Let's read it together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then let's jump all the way to the last verse of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 22, we'll actually read the last two verses of the Bible. It says this, he who testifies to these things say, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the fact that your people can come together as a corporate body on this morning and worship you. Father, we can lay aside our problems. We can lay aside our struggles. We can lay aside the things that divide us. And we can come here today united under the banner of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that you are here with us 
this morning. Lord, encourage us today. Remind us today. Help us to realize the great responsibility and privilege that we have, what you have called us to do. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Your outline has three simple points, and I'm going to mention them, and we're going to get to do something unique today. But the first thing I wrote down is this. The Bible begins with the creation of all things and ends with the renewal of all things, and in between offers an interpretation of the meaning of all of history. What I'm saying is sometimes we see a a verse here and a verse there, and we look at the Bible in portions, or we look at the Bible in pieces, and we fail to realize that from the beginning of creation to the end, when God renews everything, God has one message that he's trying to proclaim, and he has one purpose that he's trying to accomplish. What happens between the first page of Scripture and the last page of Scripture gives meaning to all of human history. Here's what I want you to catch today. God has a sovereign plan. Amen? God has a sovereign plan. God has a perfect plan that he is bringing to fruition. You ever sit back and scratch your head and say, what in the world is God doing? (laughs) I mean, you look at the chaos that's taking place in our world. You look at the division that's taking place in our country. And we sit back and think, man, who's in charge? Who's in control? Well, I submit to you today that God is in control. And that God is accomplishing his perfect plan in the world. But not only is he accomplishing that in the world, he is accomplishing that in your life, and he's accomplishing that through your life. You see, God's perfect plan is not just for the cosmos, it's not just for the planet, but God has a perfect plan for you and for me. Notice the second thing in your outline. The second thing I wrote is this. The Bible is the only story that explains the way things were, creation, the way things are, the fall, the way things will be, redemption, or excuse me, the way things could be, redemption, and the way things will be, restoration. So you see that? The Bible talks about those four things. The way things were, at creation, the way things are, we live in a fallen world, the way things could be, Jesus came and redeemed it, and the way things will be when Jesus restores all things. That right there is the big picture. We call that the four-chapter gospel. Four things, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. As evangelicals, at times we fail because we minimize that big picture to a smaller picture. And we talk just about two things. We talk about the fall. We're all sinners, and the Bible tells us that. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there's nobody righteous, no, not one. And then redemption, that people came to redeem us. And those are two phenomenal aspects of the gospel. Aren't you glad today that Jesus came to redeem fallen sinners? Amen? But that's not all of the story of God. There's more to the story of God. It's like me standing up introducing myself and saying, my name's Brian, I'm a man, and I'm a pastor. That's true. But there's more than that. I'm a man, I'm a pastor, but I'm also a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather, and you might sit back and say, why would you ignore significant parts of who you are? That's a great question. At times, if we're not careful, we ignore significant parts of the big picture. If all we talk about is the fall and redemption, we're missing major parts of God's plan. Listen, catch me today. So many of us view salvation as a bus ticket to heaven. And once I have my bus ticket stamped, in other words, once there's been a moment in my life that I've repented of my sins and I've trusted Christ as Savior and I have my pass to heaven, sometimes we sit back and cross our arms and say, okay, I'm ready to go. You know, it's Brad, as Brad talked about last Sunday, why didn't God just say, beam me up, you know? Why is that? Because God has a bigger 
plan. God has a bigger purpose. God has something that he wants to accomplish between you, or or excuse me, through you and through me. So here's the third thing I want you to catch. Understanding the big picture helps you to find your place in God's story. You see, when you when you see and you understand the big picture, it's like you're standing at the Latin American Tower and you see all of Mexico City. It's like flying in on an airplane and you just don't see your neighborhood. You see everything. When all of a sudden you understand the big picture, you understand, okay, where you fit in that picture and what is your part in God's plan. We've talked about the fact that each of us have five spheres in which we live, our self, our family, our work, our church, and our community. And God has us in these five spheres for a purpose. And God desires to use you in all five of those spheres, not just in your home, not just in your own life, but God desires to use you at your work. God desires to use you in the community. And God desires to use you at church as well. Your work matters. That's one thing for you to hear that truth from a pastor. You expect Pastor Brian to stand up and tell you these things. It's my job. It's, it's what I do. You expect that. But I want to bring up three guys from our faith family that have learned this truth and have begun to apply it to their lives. See, we started this journey about your work matters before we ever presented it to you. There were five or six guys here at HCC that we began to examine this, and we began to allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to our heart and convict us of these things. So I'm going to ask all three of the guys that come up. They know who they are. I'll introduce them. First of all, we have Matt Sinelli. Let's give Matt a hand. Matt and, Matt and Betty have been part of our church for a while. Matt is, our, Matt is actually the owner of Walk on Water Pools. And so, uh, so, so if you need a pool cleaner, Matt's the guy. He actually walks on water and cleans it throughout all of there. Rome, uh, Rome uh, served, Rome and Jackie served as, uh, serve as deacons in our congregation. And Rome is the owner of, uh, of It's About Time Painting. I'm giving these guys plugs for their businesses. They didn't know I was going to do that. And uh, Sean, I'm not sure what, what I'm just teasing. Sean, uh, Sean works at SunTrust Bank. I think you're the VP of corporate finance or something like that. Isn't that right? Or the president or CVO or something like that. I can't remember what it is. So, so, so here's what I want to do with these guys. I want them to tell you how these truths that we've been studying the last four or five weeks have transformed the way they think and transform the way that they live their lives. So you guys just kind of jump in whenever you want. I'm gonna throw out a question and let's just have a conversation, just the four of us up here today. So, so, so before we ever started this journey, and we did, what we did is we met once a month for six months, is that right guys? So, so, so we met once a month for six months and began studying these truths. And so let, let me just ask you, whoever wants to, how did you view your job before we began studying these principles. So, so, so before we ever met, how did you view your job? Well, as a business owner, just wait. Yeah. As, as, a, as a business owner, it was my business. Um, and when after I did the class, I realized that it's not my business. It's, it's a position that God has put me in. It's his business. So he's put me in that position so that he can be glorified, that I can show him in what I do. Anybody else? Um, going in this beforehand, I guess I just absolutely hated my job. <laughs> I thought my job was a living nightmare. Um, Betty will testify that every morning I told her I woke up, it was a living hell repeating itself over and over. I clean pools, so I see the same dirty pool each week. Um, but what's really cool is that God showed me that, um, that, that little four section thing he was talking about. That last part, restoration, I don't know if you caught that. Um, so what, what paradigm shift for me was that every time I clean the pool, I'm restoring the kingdom back to its original state. And so that just transformed my whole business. Cool, 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 cool. Want to say anything, Sean? You want me to move on? Sorry. Good. Um, and, and I can say, it's okay. I know Matt and I had conversations like crazy before we took this class. And, you know, Matt's like, man, Brian, what I do is a waste of time. 
I, I mean, remember that. And, and uh, I think I need to be in ministry full time or I think I need to quit this job and go do something else. And so before we took this, I mean, there was a level of frustration that was really high for you, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 very much so. So, so uh, as we began talking about this fact that that not just what you do on Sunday, but what you do between mo- or Monday to Friday and Monday to Saturday matters. Was that hard to grasp? And if it was hard to grasp, was there an aha moment when all of a sudden it was like, I get it, it sunk in, I get it? Sure. I, I think what, uh, during the class we talked about, you know, the way I've kind of viewed my work is, is living the Christian life and letting people see the influence and see the Christian behaviors and having an opportunity to witness. And that's clearly very important, but viewing work as actual worship and, and doing it for the glory of God and doing it well mm. was, was something that I, I hadn't thought about. I do it for my, my boss, but not, not my boss. <laughs> and so that, that something that certainly, certainly changed my viewpoint, but the aha moment for me was when I heard that, <clears throat> I had a little bit of skepticism, and, and I, I even made a comment. I said, it's going to take me more than one class to really appreciate and validate that. And, and, and the gentleman, Eric Welch, who was leading the group with Pastor Brian, made a comment, and he said, well, take a look at Jesus' life. And he started his ministry when he was around 30. And what did he do before that? You know, we, we know him as a, as a carpenter. And so... Here you have Christ's son who, for we, all we know is that three-year period of ministry, but he, he worked for who knows how long, you know, up until he started his ministry. And so that was my big, you know, wow and aha moment. And that was, that was powerful because, I mean, Eric had a way of asking the question. And so he basically looked at Sean and he said, so you're basically saying that the first 30 years of Jesus' life was a waste, Right. That, that it really didn't count. And, and Sean's like, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. And Eric's like, yeah, that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. And so to come to realize that when Jesus was there as a 20-year-old making a table or making a chair or cutting wood, that wasn't a waste of time. There was value in that for the kingdom of God. And that was, that was, a, that was a powerful moment for you. Any of you guys want to add something? If, I, if, if I'm honest, I wasn't viewing, I was, I was working and, and the business was basically to make money, to pay the rent, to you know, pay the mortgage and do all of those things that we need and are necessary. But when I, at the moment that I really, really understood that my work is important and that I can actually change lives through what I do, because I'm mm-hmm. responsible for lives. I have employees and everything else like that. And how they view me, how they view Christ in me. I mean, I, mean, I just came to me that, man, I'm not doing a very good job of that. I'm not mm. really being a good steward of what God gave me, you know. I thought I was being a good steward because I was doing the things that I needed to do in the material world. But on my spiritual level, I was falling. I was failing big time. Mm. So I've had to make some changes. But I, it came to me and I said, man, I could be doing so much better. He's given me a platform where I can actually serve God. And be a witness to who he is in our lives and who he is. Well, yeah. So, so, so when we looked at those concepts, so we saw those four things. So, you know, the, the creation, so God created the world in perfection, and then the fall, and then obviously redemption, and then restoration. So how does the fall play in? And I'm not talking about fall, winter, summer, spring. I'm talking about, you know, Adam and Eve falling and all of us being sinners. How... How does that truth play into what you guys do on a regular basis? Do you get the question? Yeah. You get the question? yeah. Well, for me, fall is the worst time of season to do pools because it's really hot outside. So, <laughs> um, no. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the, the way that the fall, um, what changed for me was, obviously the fall is that we've all sinned. We've all fall short. You know, we all um, take advantage of each other, especially when you're in business. I mean, taking advantage of each other is going to happen. Um, so for me before I used to take it so personally and what I would do is I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and minister to you and share Jesus with you after you owe me $200 and you don't want to pay it, you know? 
So for me, what, what it took was a swallowing of, of my pride um, to realize that I, I'm no different than these people. And so the, the end game is restoration, right? So if the end game is restoration, then I need to reach beyond the fall and take on Christ and say, okay, th there was actually an incident where somebody owed me 300 bucks. And I'm like, you know what, Lord, he's not going to pay me. I'm going to end up canceling the account, but I'm going to use this to minister to him. And so I told him, I said, you know what? You owe me 300 bucks, but the debt's been paid. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, I owe you money. I'm like, the debt's been paid. You don't have to pay it. And he's like, I don't understand. I said, well, if you ever take some time, look up Jesus Christ because the debt's been paid. And that's it. And that's the last time I dealt with him. Wow. Wow. So, by the way, if you're looking to, yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let's, let me. If you're looking for a pool guy that you don't have to pay, maybe match the guy. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but the truth, think through this. Matt cleans pools because we live in a broken world. If we didn't live in a broken world, pools wouldn't get dirty and algae wouldn't build on the inside of a pool. Think about it, all right? Rome's job is because we live in a broken world. If we didn't live in a broken world, paint wouldn't ship, and, 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 and you wouldn't have to paint again. You'd paint one time, and it would be done for all of eternity. Sean's job happens because we live in a broken world. People mismanage money, and businesses go under, and all of that. And so the, the simple truth is that our jobs exist, whatever our jobs are. Because we live in a fallen world. And, and Matt made a great statement. Sometimes we get surprised when fallen people act like fallen people, right? And so when sinners act like sinners, we sit back, Ben, I can't believe they treated me that way. And yet to sit back and realize that we live in a world filled with fallen people, and we are fallen people who have only been redeemed and rescued by the grace of God, it changes the way that, that, that we approach our lives on a regular basis. So then understanding, so creation, fall, redemption. How does redemption as a banker, as a pool guy, as a painter, how does redemption reconnect you with your purpose? For, for, for me, it, again, it was, uh, the, I'm, I'm in sales and, and obviously uh, post the Great Recession, everybody has a view of banks and bankers. <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's easy at different times to, whether it's a behavioral thing, whether it's um, cutting corners, whether it's looking out and doing something for, for, that's beneficial for me personally or the bank as opposed to the customer, you know, those are all behaviors that's, that's because of the fall. And so with, with redemption and restoration, it's, it's the opposite of that, and, and it's looking at different things I do at work and people will say, you know, the way that you approach things are a little different than others. And, you know, what's, what's sort of different about, you know, kind of your attitude towards the way you approach business. And, um, and our bank is, we have a really neat, almost like a Christian culture. We don't say that. And I kind of wonder, I've never asked our CEO, but it, it, we say lighting the way to financial well-being is, is our motto, which sounds really close to Christian, um, a Christianity. And it's, it's uh, seeing some of the those traits that that you know we try to exhibit either as a as a culture so we don't do those bad behaviors and or seeing some of those bad behaviors and realizing that's that's how we try to be different as you know personally and, and as Christians. Cool. Anybody else? <laughs> the word that comes to mind is integrity. Mm -hmm. um, because after the fall, you know, we've accepted Christ in our life, and he's redeemed us, you know, and, and we have a responsibility, you know, and integrity is not just what you do that people see. The integrity really lies when you're by yourself in your office and you're making business deals and you're putting together your contracts and you're putting together your, your estimates, you know, and, you know, I want to get to a point where I fall short all the time because I'm still a sinner and to no extent have I achieved any perfection but I strive for it each and every day. So my purpose and my goal is to glorify God in everything that I do. Show people that 
you don't have to cheat, that you don't have to be dishonest. There are honest and loyal people out there that you can trust. And I want them to be able to connect that by knowing that I'm a man of God. Amen. I want God to be glorified through what I do. Amen. Amen. Here, here's the truth that doesn't matter whether you're a pastor, whether you're whatever you are. Catch this. The gospel changes everything. Why don't you say that with me today? Would you say that with me today? The gospel changes everything. It not only changes my eternal destiny, and it, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, it's changed your eternal destiny, but it changes your perspective. Husbands, it changes the way you treat your wives. Wives, it changes the way you respond to your husbands. It changes the way that you handle your money. It changes the way you treat your neighbor. It changes the way you do your job. And all of that has changed, not because we're better people, but because of what Jesus has done for us. And we have tried to, uh, to make this divide that the gospel is just about, okay, are you going to heaven? Good. Now go do your job. And we've separated and we've failed to realize that the gospel changes. It should change every single day the way that I live my life, the way that I respond to people, the way that I handle conflict, the way that I deal with people that I don't like, the way that I handle a boss. The gospel changes everything. And so our work does matter. What we do Monday to Friday matters. Why? Because it matters to God. And it matters for the gospel. So let me ask you guys this. So, so in those five spheres, and you can pick either one, yourself, your, your family, your job, your community, your church, how is understanding this concept change the way that you approach any of those things? How's it changed it? How's it different, having this true? Um, I think, for me, I think um, uh, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, those four things, the four chapters of the gospel, when you understand those things and you apply them to every sphere that he just mentioned, you know, your, your spouse, your job, your family, coworkers, when you apply those to each individual thing, it's kind of funny how this works. If you ever take water and you put sand and dirt and rocks and you swish it around, they layer themselves. The rocks settle to the bottom, the sand and the dirt and so on. And so when you apply those four chapter gospels to each variations of, revela of re relationships in your life, they separate in the way that God wants them to be, which is your spouse at the top and then your family job and so on. And so what, we, what I have done is I have forced to try to pull out things and put them at the top, um, and it just wrecks everything. And so applying the four chapters to those relationships was transform, transforming in my life. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I kind of go back to maybe, Matt, your, your view of saying, you know, what, what am I doing at work and, and how is this important? And just having more of, of an appreciation for God's plan and knowing that, you know, we, are, we were all created to work before the fall and that doing something with with uh, realizing that it's everything we do do it for the glory of god and appreciating that plan and the fact that that actually is worship was really you know changed my mindset and my view and was you know really a good takeaway from this excellent so so if each of you had i'll give each of you a second 30 seconds if there's one thing from this whole series that you've taken away and you would challenge our congregation with? What's the one thing that you would sit back and say, man, this is what I would encourage you, how, what God's done in my life. Here's the one thing I would encourage you with. I would say that in all aspects of our lives, we should surrender it to the Lord. That, that, we should, that we should just have a heart and a mindset that every day that we wake up and say, God, show me how I can be better. Give me the opportunities where I can be a light and shine who you are. Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, you know, the fall and the redemption, we've all fallen. Mm, and amen. God has been there to lift us up and resurrect us. And he's been resurrected. But he did that for us. And we have the opportunity to do that to others. We will have the opportunity each and every day in everything that we do, not only in our work, but in our family, in every aspect of our life, to surrender that to the Lord and shine and say, God, 
who can I demonstrate your love to today? Amen. That's good. That's good. Um, I, it's amazing how much prayer you can get done when you cut grass. Um, <laughs> So just praying about what <laughs> Pastor Brian uh, wanted us to share. Um, real quick, uh, Luke 10.2, um, Jesus was talking about that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. What I thought was key in that verse is it says that, the lo- that to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Did you guys ever catch that? That means that the harvest that we're working every day is not ours. That's it's right. his. So if it belongs to him, we need to do it his way. We can't be doing it our way. And so that challenged me out of this class. It challenged me that walk on water pools is not mine because I've, obviously I've never walked on water. And so he did. So it's his. So I need to operate under his parameters. And then I think of uh, Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Amen. And so the challenge that I would say and the challenge that's for myself is the reason why we want to give up is because we're not happy in the current circumstances we're in. We're not happy with what God is doing in our lives. We're not happy with how he's doing it. But he's put us in this waiting room for a reason, for a season. And so instead of bucking at that to say, wait a minute, it's his harvest, it's his work. And so what challenged me was, you know what, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to take less CEO ownership of my company, and I'm going to let him be the CEO, and I'm just the idiot that pushes the pool pole around. And so just looking at it that way and, and just being submissive and being ready to harvest is where I'm at. Every day I, I, I wake up, I look for the grain that needs to be cut. That's what I do. I bring my hay sickle to work. Um, I hang out with these guys, and these guys sharpen my hay sickle. You know, I don't know if you guys ever try to cut something with a dull knife. It doesn't work. So, you know, so I would challenge you guys is don't do this alone. Get out of the woodwork and, you know, connect with other people. So that's what I would say. Hey, Matt, can I ask you just one thing? So one of the things you've shared with me is that not only has this changed, though, the perspective that you do your work, but... But even God's given you more opportunities now than ever before to minister to Absolutely. people. Can you just kind of flesh that up for a second? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So here's a key point. Um, when you're at work, if you're not surrendered, as Rome was saying, and submissive to God in your life, there's areas of your life that you're not submissive of. If you're not, what happens is, I believe, based on Scripture, is that you are not able, God will not use you as a vessel for mercy and for grace in people's lives. If you're hung up on anger or, you know, whatever, stress, whatever, anxiety, you know, these things have to be dealt with. And I'm not discouraging those that struggle. What I'm saying is, um, you know, as I came to God, I said, okay, I'm having certain areas where I am not, my happiness is being found in my work, and that's wrong. It should be found in God. And in doing so, I was losing opportunity to, to minister to people and to share the gospel with people. So what I was telling Pastor Brian was, now that my focus has changed and I've just given up and I just submit, you can't commit, you have to submit first, then you can commit. Once you surrender and submit, um, there has been so many opportunities where I'm like praying for customers that don't even believe in Jesus. Like, I was like, can I stop and pray? And they say yes. It's like, this is awesome, man. This is so cool. Half of these people are Jewish. And, they, you know, it's like, you know, Jesus is a Jew, you know. So, you know, I pray for them. And, and you know what happens is, is the relationship changes. My work now no longer becomes about work. It's about ministering and touching these people's lives. I have rare access to people's homes. How many people do you invite over your home? No, but the long guy and the pool guy are there. And so that's what happens with me. I'm like covert coming into their house with Jesus, you know, so. <laughs> that's excellent. That's excellent. Sean, if you could share one thing, what would, uh, what's on your heart? I, I think when we were going through the class, uh, Eric was, uh, at one point, it was a scientist and had an engineering background, and he made the comment that at, at work, you know, it's not secular, first of all, so we talked about that, but, but secondly, doing the best you can and creating, you know, solving some disease or creating some product or being the best at your job where you get promoted and are seen at a higher level and are more visible. Um, those types of things separate us. And, and sometimes Christians, I think, can have a, a, a 
people can view us sometimes as being lazy and maybe we don't all we care about is coming to church and not this other part not work and not other areas and saying be an example at work and do it so well and outperform everyone else where they say wow why is this person look at the hustle look at the effort look how great they are at their job and and oh wow they're a christian and mm. and that in and of itself is is worship to god and and it's it's powerful it's a powerful testimony without even having to give the testimony excellent hey let's give these guys a hand i appreciate them i appreciate them sharing their heart if you're interested in 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 how your job of sitting back saying okay brian i'd really like to know how this works for me, all right? Starting next Sunday at nine o'clock in the conference room, Eric Welch, who led this discussion, is gonna be leading just a four-week discussion. Anybody is welcome to come talking about how you can enjoy your work and how you can make your work count for God. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, come back and be a part of the discussion. So as we, as we draw all this to a close today, here's what I want you to catch. The simple truth is, what you do counts, and what you do matters. And God wants you and me and all of us to represent him every moment of our lives. We began talking about the sacred secular divide and why it exists. And the simple truth that exists, because we have created it. <laughs> It doesn't exist because God has created it. It exists because of the fact that we have created it. It's interesting, if you remember, we began this series uh, five, six weeks ago. We gave you a little survey, that, that little blue slip of paper, and we asked you to anonymously fill out a survey. And we've took all of that data and we've collated all of that data. It's really, really interesting. And by the way, I want you to know, we are just like all other congregations around the country because our data was similar to theirs. But we began the series with this survey and only 12% of us, so we're probably 360, 370 people in here, only 12% of us, about 35 or 40, sat back and said, 90% of what I do during the week is dedicated to serving God. They had a great reason for saying that because you sat back and thought, no, I go to church this certain period and then. But what we've tried to lay out this week is God, God sitting back and saying, God, God saying, I don't want 12%. I don't want 15%. I don't want 25%. I want 50%. I want everything you do to count for me. So here's a question I ask you as we draw to a close today. What's your place in God's story? See, God has a plan. God has a story that he's, that he's, that he's bringing to pass in Hollywood, Florida. What is your place in God's story? You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, God desires for you and I to dedicate ourselves 24-7 to live out his principles, to be kingdom citizens. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.20, you are an ambassador for Christ. Could you imagine how it would change our community if all of a sudden we viewed ourselves differently? If now we didn't view ourselves as a couple hundred people to come together on Sunday morning, sing a couple of songs, listen to Brian Brad, stand up and do a message, and then we walk out and live our lives. If all of a sudden we viewed ourselves completely differently, if we walked out these doors in just a few moments and we viewed ourselves as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, where we work, where we live, in our families, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, I wake up realizing I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And wherever God has placed me, I want to live out the principles of the kingdom of God. Could we, church, make a difference in the city of Hollywood? We could. 
So, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something today. So, so I've given you a little sheet of paper. Would you take this little sheet of paper out? You should have gotten one when you came in today. Just a little sheet of paper. We're just asking you, put your name on it. There's no right or wrong answer to this. So I don't want you to feel like you're going to be embarrassed or not embarrassed. Just a, just a sheet of paper. It says your name, and then you are, your title is this. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter whether, whether you're Brian the pastor or whether you're you, you. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we just kind of like to know, what is your role in your family? I'm, I'm a husband, dad. I'm a husband, dad, grandfather. I'm, I'm a wife. I'm, I'm a single mom. I'm a single dad. Whatever your role is, place your role there. And then what is your employment role? What, what, what is your employment? So, so what is it that you do from Monday to Friday? You might sit back and say, I'm a waitress. I, I work at a gas station. I'm, I'm a teacher. I, uh, I work for this company. Whatever your role is, would you, would you write that down on there? This isn't a test. Would you write that down? All right? That's just your info. So, so here's the way we're going to end. Because it is so important for us to connect the gospel with what we do. It's so important to connect the cross with what we do on a regular basis. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask you, our praise team is going to lead us in, in a chorus in just a second, a contemplative chorus. Would you just take this paper, just really simple, take it, come, we have crosses here, we have cross in the back, you can put it on the altar, just kind of Give your work and your role to God. Say, God, this is who I am Monday to Friday. I give it to you. I want the gospel to be lived out through me. You spend just a few moments at the foot of the cross. Give your work, your role, your family, all of that to God. And ask God to use you to be his living representative in our community. And then let's leave here with a determination to do that. Father, thank you so much that you have redeemed us. Thank you that you didn't give up on us. All of us are sinners. All of us have fallen. All of us don't deserve a second chance. But in your love and in your grace and in your mercy, you've reached out to us and you've given us something that we could have never earned something that we don't deserve. You've given us a second chance and a third chance. And you've enabled those of us to represent you who certainly in our own power can't represent you. But in the power of the gospel, you've given us the privilege to do that. So Lord, as Rome said, and as Matt said, and as you've said in your word, it all begins with surrender. We can't commit until we surrender. So Lord, I pray you'd help us individually, whether we come forward, whether we don't, Lord, to take our roles in our family, in our job, in our community, and surrender them to you. Use us for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.